welcome to Question Time. Tonight we are in Western Supermare. On tonight's panel, Maggie Throop, biomedical scientist and business consultant, until her election as an MP in 2015, appointed Vaccines Minister by Boris Johnson in September. Labour's shadow leader in the Commons and a trained concert cellist, Thangham Debonair. Wendy Chamberlain, a former police officer, now Chief Whip and Work and Pension spokesperson for the Liberal Democrats. Professor Peter Openshaw, immunologist, professor of experimental medicine at Imperial College London and a member of NerveTag, the government's advisory body on respiratory diseases. And retail magnate, owner of chains such as Ryman's and Robert Dias, and for seven years, a dragon on BBC One's Dragon's Den, Theo Nefetis. <laughs> Welcome to my panel, welcome to our audience here in Western Supermare and welcome to you watching at home. Do join in the conversation, get stuck in, in the usual way on social media at BBC Question Time and we'll hear what you've got to say. So, our first question tonight is from Jez Thomas. I live at number 10 on my street, so can I have a Christmas party regardless of restrictions? I mean, it, it really hurts, I think, for a lot of people um, that this time last year, when the regulations were actually tough, case rates were going up, people were suffering, people were in hospital, people were losing loved ones. And to hear now that while most of us were sticking by the rules, we're sticking to our bubbles and, and doing all those things, and we were told no Christmas parties, to hear now that not only that there was a Christmas party in, 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 um, in high places, but that it was literally in the Prime Minister's residence is pretty hard, isn't it? And no, I don't think anyone should be just allowed to make up the rules as they go along, but unfortunately that is what we've seen from this Prime Minister, as someone who says one thing one day and then does something else the next day and just thinks he can blag his way out of trouble. The joke is not funny anymore. And there are people now, people now who've lost loved ones or who went through absolute heartbreak last Christmas being parted from each other. I know, I'm sure everyone here knows someone, maybe even some people in this room, who could not be with the people they loved last year. And to think that that was allowed in number 10 Downing Street, and to think that the Prime Minister had the, didn't even have the decency to admit it yesterday in PMQs, he just tried to blag his way out of it, the joke's not funny anymore, and it's really out of order. And just to answer the second part of the question, should we be having Christmas parties? Well, I mean, at the What's moment, the position I think the, the, the difficulty we've got is that we don't know yet what the Omicron virus is going to do. And I think we have a period, apparently the WHO is going to take days, I hear, rather than weeks. And, and, and obviously, Professor can tell us a bit more about that, to, so that we can make an accurate judgment as to the risk. I think we're right to be cautious and, and anxious, but also we, there are different things. I, I want people are you, to have is, fun. Is, is Labour Party going to have a Christmas party? Uh, I, I don't think at the moment that that's going to okay. be appropriate, okay, okay. because it was due to be on Monday. We don't know enough at this point. See you. No Christmas party for my team. Um, we've decided to cancel it. We're going to have a summer party because we really can't take the risk. I mean, I'd rather they had a safe Christmas with their family and friends rather than something happen at uh, a massive works Christmas do. Now, the problem we've got, of course, is the lack of information. And I am concerned that this government is not treating it seriously because... All, I mean, they say they've been proportionate. They're saying they're taking precautions. Actually, they're not being proportionate. They're contradictory in everything they're saying. Then, I mean, whichever minister you speak to, you get a different answer. So we can't actually tell. So the best thing is to be safe. Let me just do a quick show of hands. Who here is intending to go to a Christmas party? Wow. And who has had a Christmas party cancelled? OK, so not so many people. Um, quite a few of you had your hands up. The lady in the pink sweater, you had your hand up. This time last year, um, my parents um, are from South London, so we couldn't go and see them. My parents both had COVID. We followed the guidance. We did what we were told. I'm stuck in Western Supermare. Mum and Dad are at home in South Norwood. And then you hear they're having Christmas parties while we are suffering. It makes me sick. It really does. It makes me really upset. Maggie? 
Well, I respect that people have put up with a lot over the last 20 months. Nobody could have predicted what was going to happen. But what about the Christmas party in particular? Well, the Prime Minister said quite clearly on, uh, on Wednesday at PMQs that all guidance was followed. But that, and is, I, but and that I, wasn't the question he was asked, I, which I, I think is why I, everyone's laughing, Maggie. So like, you, might, like, 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 you might as well put it straight, because we've got you here now. Yeah. So uh, like, was it. there a Christmas party or wasn't there? I, I wasn't there. No, I, I, I don't think you but still... No, Prime Minister, I'm, I'm sure, sure, like, like the, I'm uh, sure you were briefed like before the, you came like on, like Maggie. Like the leader what? of the Labour Party, I wasn't invited to whatever was happening at, at number 10. Who if wants to know if there was a Christmas party or what not? Party? Yeah. Uh, come on, Maggie. Put us... Look, all these people here, it's question time. Was there a Christmas party or wasn't there? I am not. I am not aware of the Christmas party. The whatever happened at number ten. We've got to remember that number Maggie ten is, is a number, answer, number, yes or a number no. ten Come on. is a workplace. It's a yes or a no. And we will have workplace, workplace parties. And either. I have been reassured that all guidance was carefully followed as it continues. <laughs> Does that answer happened? your question? No. no. Do you want another go, Maggie? Lag. My answer's not going to change because you know, <laughs> it's. The guidance was followed as the Prime Minister... But that must mean that there wasn't a party, say. then, because the guidance was no Christmas party. There was a party. The, what, whatever the event was, then so there the was, guidance was There was, was an event. I, I gather that the, whatever people... I mean, we, and also, this, this has been just uh, rumour and hearsay. <laughs> and, yeah... Uh, no, it's the, not! The, 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 the Commons be quite clear <laughs> it. that all guidance was, was followed at Maggie. number 10 for whatever, Come whether it's on. business meetings or whatever. But so I wasn't invited, just like <laughs> the Deputy Leader of the Labour Party isn't invited to the well, Labour least, Party well, party well, next week. It's just a silly thing to say, Maggie, because A, it's she was, and B, we're cancelling it. That's just ridiculous. We weren't sure. Well, Maggie, you, what you have done, done for which we, we all thank you, <laughs> is you have confirmed there was an event. So, yes, the man here in the maroon sweater. Yeah, I just wondered why... Why has it taken so long, nearly a year, for this story to break? Surely the media knew beforehand, and shouldn't they have brought out? Is it just convenient political timing? OK. That's assuming the media knew. Yeah. I don't know if that, I certainly didn't know about it. The woman here in the red leg. Yeah. How can you say it, is a ru it was a rumour? Who would be making this up? Well, I think what I'm saying is a rumour that, uh, that guidance was broken. You know, the guidance was followed. But well, it can't be in a party if guidance was followed. Because there exactly. shouldn't have been no party. And I'm no. afraid that your Prime Minister have just got you all in a little bubble, so you have to say what you think he wants you to say. That's not the case. Man here in the brown sweater. Um, to use a football analogue, if the manager lost the dressing room, then there'd be no confidence left. left. Has Boris Johnson lost the dressing room? OK. And the man next to you in the tie there. Yes. How many people does it need to be a party? I haven't heard how many was at this party. More than a bubble. Well, for, according to one source, dozens. But um, Ma perhaps you could tell us, Maggie. We knew it was an event I now. How many there. people were there? I don't know. More than a bubble. <laughs> OK. Um, Peter, can I have a Christmas party regardless of restrictions? That's the question. Well, we have not been planning to have a Christmas party because with things as they are, regardless of Omicron, we thought that the chances of getting infected were too high. So we'd not been planning that party. There are several other parties which I was invited to which have been cancelled. So do you think the government is right? I mean, Boris Johnson has said twice now people shouldn't cancel their parties, they should still have their Christmas parties. Do you think he's wrong about well, that then? Well, personally, I wouldn't feel safe going to a party at the moment if it involved being indoors in an enclosed space where you're close to other people and people are not wearing masks. Even if they've been tested and vaccinated, I wouldn't feel safe. And I wonder if this might uh, affect, possibly reinforce your view, uh, a study has just come out from the National Institute for Communicable Disease in South Africa, which shows substantial ability on the part of Omicron to evade immunity from previous COVID infections. Do you, can you just translate for us what that means? So the evidence is still emerging. I mean, from what I understand, the chances of being admitted with, um, with Omicron are reduced to hospital. very significantly if you have been vaccinated. So they're seeing a lower proportion of those admitted um, who have been vaccinated. So that's a good sign. The more serious end of the spectrum of disease seems to be reasonably well controlled by vaccination. But 
the more, um, you know, the less severe end of disease is much harder to protect against with vaccination because really you're telling the immune system that there's something there by injecting it into the muscle in your arm. The immune system doesn't know it's got to concentrate on what's going on in your nose and your lung. And if this uh, research is suggesting substantial ability to evade immunity from previous COVID infections, how worrying is that? I think we're all very worried. I mean, the, the number of changes in the genetic sequence of the virus is quite unusual. You know, to have 50 mutations, um, many of which have actually been seen in previous variants, all concentrated in this one variant, is very concerning. And a lot of those mutations are in this spike protein, which is the attachment protein and the target for antibody. So we're still waiting to see how much change there is, but we are very, very concerned about it. The man in the white shirt. Given that the works Christmas parties are looking to be cancelled and all these businesses will have now ordered their stock, their provisions for these, is there going to be any compensation or offer of recompense for these companies that have clearly shelled out for people to have their Christmas parties? What happens to them? Uh, Wendy, you can give us your, your position on that and also answer the original question. Can I have a Christmas party regardless of restrictions? Yeah, I think when we look back to a year ago, um, and what happened in terms of Christmas being cancelled and, and obviously parts of the UK where families were literally in the car with their turkeys and being told to turn back and, and not meet really hard. One of the things I also find incredibly hard about um, this story is the fact that the excuse being given was those in government were working incredibly hard. Everybody was working incredibly hard. Those people in supermarkets were working incredibly hard. Our emergency services, both my stepchildren are serving police officers. They were working incredibly hard, enforcing the rules that the government had put in place. So to hear that those rules weren't being followed right at the heart of government, I think really does uh, stick in people's uh, uh, crawl. In relation to businesses, um, I think we do need a definition and this is what we're looking for. We le need clarity from the government. We understand, I think everybody understands that this is a fast moving situation, but we need clarity. So when we talk about a Christmas party, what do we mean? Do we mean a gathering, as, as Peter said, in terms of a large number of people with no masks on? Or are we talking about still ensuring that Christmas lunches with small numbers of people that we have in hospitality set settings can continue? We need that clarity from the government um, and we need it as, as soon as possible. And rightly, if there are cancellations happening or if there are further restrictions, yeah, it is a requirement for the government to, set, to step up to provide that support. Absolutely. Businesses are on, are on their knees. You know, furlough has always been talked about as a really good thing. That, and, and it was, but it was costing businesses money in the latter stages. These businesses are indebted. Okay. Hospitality has been really hard hit and it does need support. Man at the back in the hat. Oh, quite, well, there we go, yeah. Um, yeah, it's quite nice to be invited to Tory Roast, um, so I'm quite happy not to have a Christmas party. But um, I think... It's, well, I, I'm not sure what anyone describes as a Tory roast, but OK, uh, well, that's your like view. Anyway, I wanted to follow on with Theo's point, because I think it got lost. Um, I work for um, Royal Mail and I've been clinically extremely vulnerable. So I've been banged up for 18 months at home with my daughter as well. And I think the one thing that really sticks is, I mean, my, you know, my daughter's got massive anxiety. My partner has now as well. Um, and I think the one thing about that is they've reintroduced the wearing of masks. So, you know, I've worn a mask at work the whole time. I've been back for a year. The fact is that people have slowly been getting used to, oh, maybe I don't need to do it anymore, things like that. I think Theo's point is absolutely crucial because for all that time, for all that, you know, recompense, compensation, furlough, everything like that, do you really want to chuck it down the toilet now and just say, like, OK, we can just kind of do it and have no clarity and just blag their way through it, as In terms people of mentioned. Can have I think or not. it's absolutely crucial that people can stay safe. Or, or why did I even go through that? What was the point? OK. The man here in the blue sweater. While I appreciate that there is a need for celebration for the Christmas, I believe whatever, I mean, even if the politicians give some sort of advice, there is an element of personal responsibility in terms of weighing up whether it is sensible for me to actually attend a party, when it's a party, okay, or how many people. And if it is a small family get together, okay, it may be sensible, you may be in a protected bubble. Whereas if you are going into a bigger group in a restaurant or a pub, where there may be hundreds of people, I think there is a danger of infection. So be cautious, be sensible in your decision making. Okay.
I'm going to move on and take another question from Paul Steffens. Hello, again. Yeah. In light of the new COVID variant, do you believe that all non-essential travel should be postponed until spring, as more variants are likely to emerge due to the lack of vaccinations in many countries? Peter, I want to come to you first, obviously, with your... You, you, we know better than any of us here on the panel about, about COVID, about uh, uh, what we know about Omicron so far. These are really difficult questions to answer. <clears throat> we know that by the time we detect a variant, it probably is spreading. You know, by the time that we knew it was in South Africa, there were almost certainly cases on our shores already. I think the benefit of reducing the amount of travel, because it isn't completely abolished, of course, reducing the amount of travel will give us more time to find out more about how this variant behaves and how severe is the disease, what degree of protection there is. So the, the purpose of travel restrictions is to slow it down and buy time, but it's not going to stop spread completely. And do you think non-essential travel should be postponed until spring? I think there's a risk with any amount of, with any travel, and we need to take all precautions we can to stop spread during travel, which means a lot of testing, a lot of mask wearing um, during transport. And I personally would restrict my own travel as much as possible to what is absolutely essential. And you mentioned testing. Are you in favour of pre-departure tests, for example? I, I think that testing before you travel and testing after you've travelled are both very helpful in trying to reduce the spread. Testing is not infallible but it certainly is a, a very good adjunct to reducing the amount of spread. Theo, well, should all non-essential travel we, be we, we have got an economy to look after as well. There will be life after COVID, uh, for most people anyway, as long as we're sensible. And, you know, we do have to get some grown up. And I, I, someone said about Tory bashing. It's not Tory bashing. It's called frustration from, from people who are the cold face running, working in the economy, running the economy, worried about their colleagues. We need clear guidance. And we can't just have nonsense and spin when people's lives are at stake and the economy and the future of our children are at stake. And all we're getting is Peppa Pig and spin. And that just is not good enough. I'll come to you in a moment, Maggie. Let's hear from us. The, the young man at the back. Uh, just on Theo's point, I think it would be really interesting to listen to an economist talk about the pandemic, because as much as we have lots of views from scientists, it would be quite interesting to listen to an economist, because health and the economy are really interlinked. interlinked. But um, well, we have plenty of economists on the panel throughout the series. We don't, we don't have one tonight, but we do have Mr. Retail here. Apologies, here. I, I meant in a wider context. But um, given that we don't know very much about the Omicron variant, could it prove to be our way out of the pandemic if it proves not to be very deadly? Could we get out through inoculation? OK, I might come back to you on that, Peter, if I may. And there was someone behind you. Yes, you want to ask a question? Uh, with the original question about to, will we be allowed to travel to other countries, I've got a trip booked for New Year's to go to Amsterdam. I don't know if that's going to be cancelled. If I had to pay for the flight, I had to pay for my passport. If I waste my money, when am I going to find out if I'm allowed to go or not? Well, I'm not sure anyone on the panel will be able to, to answer exactly that. The, the man in the red T-shirt, because there's still so much that we don't know. Uh, thank you. Um, I think what's important there is make sure that as many people are vaccinated as possible, and this means any spare vaccines that the UK has should be given to people abroad, because it's quite clear, and I'm not a scientist by any stretch of the imagination, but what we are being told and what the evidence clearly is, the more people that is vaccinated, the quicker and the safer we will all be. OK. Thank you. Uh, you might want to, to uh, refer to that question as well, but the original question is, should all non-essential travel be postponed until spring? And obviously spring, to the man that perhaps wondering whether he'll get his, his trip to Amsterdam. Or not. Well, I, I, I think, you know, even Peter didn't say definitively no. And, and I think we also, as we said earlier, we do need to wait until we know more about Omicron, but I think we need to be careful and cautious. I think we should have pre-departure PCRs 
I think it's astonishing that you can get on a flight or, or a boat, you can arrive here, you can get off, you can get on the bus, you can mix with other people and you can get home and you still wait two days before you're being tested. Now, that is a problem. But I think there are other things, such as investing in ventilation, which should have happened months ago. The government was warned that schools were going to need ventilation. I hear from teachers now who are still telling me that the only ventilation options they've got in December is open the window, which is seriously problematic. But we also need to remember that the economy, and we've, we've had questions about the economy, the economy suffers if COVID runs rampant as well. So, you know, the, 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 it's, it's not a simple case of if we shut things down, the economy's damaged, therefore we shouldn't shut things down. And I don't think that's what you were saying. But I do think that economists, and when I've read economic briefings, that's some of the complexities have come out in that, which is we also can't afford to have the economy shut down because everybody's sick. And what about sending more vaccines abroad? Well, absolutely. And I think it's astonishing. You know, Gordon Brown, Labour's Gordon Brown said last year, we need an international partnership to make sure that people are vaccinated everywhere. Look what happens when we don't achieve that. The government said they were going to get 30 million vaccines sent abroad by the end of this year. My understanding is it's only 11.5 million doses that have gone out so far. And shamefully, in August, 600,000 doses were thrown away because they hadn't been distributed. Now, that's not good planning. It's also not sensible because none of us are going to be safe from this virus until the entire world has got a grip and we're going to have to help each other. It doesn't benefit us just to hoard all the vaccines. The man here in the front in the blue shirt. Is it time to make vaccinations compulsory? Is it time to make them compulsory? OK, let's hear from the man in the grey sweater and the glasses in the middle there. Hey, we'll just get a mic to you, sorry. It's a bit tricky. Here's, here's one of the problems that we don't actually know. So, for instance, over the past 12 months, I've booked three trips to Poland. Every single one was cancelled. One of them wasn't, because had I gone, I'd have had to do a fortnight's worth of quarantine, so I cancelled it myself. The rules are changing every couple of days. So it's, you've got to wear a mask. You don't have to wear a mask. You can go in shops. You can't go in pubs anymore. Don't we need some kind of like sort of actual plan that's kind of definite so we know where we stand? Yeah, I mean, no one said you can't go to a pub uh, any, at the moment. So you still can if you want to after the programme. Yes, the, the, the woman in the white top here. So I think the government should be clearly identifying the red country list on a regular basis once a week. I've got a niece who's in Canada who hasn't been home for 18 months and her trip back in December is up in the air is she going to be able to come back what are the rules is it, and it's not clear on the government website no and it changes so I think they should perhaps every Monday or Tuesday or whatever day of the week provide a regular update to the travel list so people have at least a week to organize cat care Dog care, <laughs> child care. You're talking from personal experience here about the cat care, <laughs> yeah. right? Okay. So yeah, I think it should be on a regular basis. Maggie, so the question is uh, from Paul: Do you believe all non-essential travel should be postponed until spring? Uh, we've had a lot of other questions about the number of vaccinations should be sent abroad, about making it clear which countries are and are not on the red list. I don't think we should cancel travel and, 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 and essential travel until spring, not at all. I mean, we took swift and decisive action to put 10 countries on the red list very, very quickly. And people now who've been to those countries have got to go into managed manage quarantine. So we are stopping that infection coming into the UK. And what about and we'll Peter's we'll point about testing? Before, I mean, your Labour's point is about PCR tests, but Peter talked about the value yeah. of testing before people get on a plane. I think we've got to take a, 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 a proportionate and very a, a balanced approach. And I think that's one thing that we're doing. And it's you know, the, the way that we took very swift action. We didn't wait for the next general review. We'd obviously the red list is reviewed on a very regular basis. And we'll have no hesitation to put any more countries onto the red list, should it be necessary. I think the, with regards to uh, you know, the economy, we do need to keep the economy going. And that's why we mandated... Uh, for face coverings just in shops and on transport and not to go well, that wider. That doesn't make sense, does it? It, it does you're make sense. You're a scientist. Sense, we, Maggie, we... you're a scientist. You know that's nonsense. I, 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 you, you, you look at other places, other venues, and you, the gentleman talked about the pub. You know, people can still go to the pub, but when you're in a pub, you tend to be drinking or drinking and but eating. You, you're normally and you normally sitting can't down wear next to cover. somebody for uh, half an hour, 10, 15, 20 minutes. When you pop into a shop, you're popping in quickly. Why would you then put masks on when you go into somewhere quickly? But where are you going to be sitting next to someone for 
possibly hours at the whole group of unventilated premises over Christmas, cheek to jowl, you don't have to wear a mask. Well, I think it's, um, it's very hard to eat and drink with a face covering on, but the, really the, the best way that we can uh, protect ourselves and, and travel and keep our economy going is for everybody to, to get boosted. As the gentleman said, you know, the value and, and the power of the vaccination programme has been incredible. You know, it's actually the anniversary of the Pfizer vaccine being regulated today. And then it was just a few days after that when the, the first jab went into somebody's arm. Outside and we heard the head of Pfizer right? today saying that, in his view, obviously there's a commercial aspect to this for him, but in his view, we will need boosters every year. Is that your, your view too? Is that well, your we, understanding? We, every year we have the flu programme, sure. and obviously we're talking about another virus, and that's why we've... Uh, so do you think we will need boosters every year for COVID? What we've done now is, is uh, pre-ordered vaccines for, for future years. I think it's only right thing that the public would expect us to, to be prepared for future years. Uh, yeah, it would be wrong of us not to, to be prepared, it really would. But, the, but can yeah. you say whether we'll need them every year or not at this stage? At the moment, it looks as if we probably will, looking at the, uh, the way the virus has gone already. I mean, one thing about this virus, it's definitely been unpredictable. Uh, just when we thought we were getting somewhere, then obviously we've got a new variant. But we've also got to remember that the most dominant variant in the UK at the moment is still the Delta variant. Mm. And okay. the, the vaccines are, are so, so powerful against, in, against the Delta variant. So the best thing people can do is to go out if you haven't had a, a jab at all get your first jab if you've delayed your second jab get that but get boosted as well and okay. we are boosting the booster program wendy should all non-essential travel be postponed until spring and then lots of other people have lo lots of the audience have have looked at other aspects on, of this too. On that too. first point on non-essential, I think it's back to a degree of clarity from the government in terms of what do we mean by non-essential travel. Our last question was talking about the fact that for many families Christmas was cancelled and I think it's very easy to think about travel just as people going on their holidays but we know that there are families who've been separated for significant periods of time as a result of Covid restrictions so I think we need to think very carefully about that and I'm certainly supportive of what Labour are calling for in, in terms of testing. We've done it before, why, why aren't we doing it again. In terms of vaccine access, um, I, I, again, you know, we are sitting on, um, it really is showing the divide between uh, the developed and developing world uh, in terms of, um, yes, what we are doing here. There is no question that, you know, it's not a case of should we be boosting and should we be providing uh, vaccines abroad, we, uh, overseas. We can do both of those things. But the other thing I would say is not only are the developing country behind, uh, countries behind in terms of vaccination, the UK government has cut its AIDS budget as well. In my constituency, St Andrews University had a direct cut to one of its programmes that was helping countries in Southern Africa in terms of COVID preparations. So we're taking the rug, we're pulling the rug out from under them, trying to actually work for themselves as well. And the final thing is, the SAGE minutes tell us that actually the best way of slowing the spread of COVID currently is to return to working from home. Um, for those who are able to do so, so that those who can't can therefore then carry out their jobs, their essential jobs, in more safety. So, Liberal Democrat policy is for everyone to work from home, is it? We, where it's possible for them to do so, absolutely. OK. Peter, can I just come back to the question that the, young, uh, the man asked at the back there, in, in terms of... I'm going to paraphrase, forgive me, but, but could... We know... There's lots we don't yet know about Omicron, but could it turn out to be a blessing in disguise if it is something that doesn't cause particularly serious illness but does boost our immunity? Well, it's a very, very interesting question to those of us who are virologists. You know, is this virus eventually going to mutate into a form that is very mild and which might actually spread amongst the population and, um, and, and cause immunity to, to subsequent iterations? So it, it is a, a theoretical possibility. We don't know whether that's going to happen. I think the news so far that we've got on, um, on, on this new variant is that it isn't especially mild. We are very concerned that there is significant disease. There have been examples with animal coronaviruses of them evolving just in the way that you describe and actually immunising en masse. Can I just pick you up on that, Peter, for a moment? Because yes. the initial reports come from South Africa were that, and it was um, only one report, but from, a, from um, uh, Ms Coetzee, uh, who um, who's a, uh, a professor in South Africa, as I understand it, who has personal experience with these cases, was saying that on the whole they are mild. But you're saying that they tend to be on the severe end then? No, I, th I think we need to know more about this. We've had descriptions from people involved in primary care 
to say that they're seeing a lot of mild cases, but we've also had descriptions of increased case numbers in hospitals, and we don't know what the balance is. We need right. to know more information before we can be sure about this. Okay. Thank you. So useful having you to answer these questions, Peter. Um, I'm going to move on, take another question, but before I do, I just want to tell you where we will be next week, which is in Hendon, uh, with former politician and, of course, train geek these days, Michael Portillo, and actress of stage and screen, including the Netflix hit Bridgerton, if you're watching that, Joa Ando, and the following week we will be in Stoke-on-Trent. So if you want to come along to either of those, Hendon or Stoke-on-Trent, go to the Question on Time website, follow the instructions there, and you can come and be part of our audience. We'd love to see you. Right, let's take our next question now from Ashley Parkinson. Isn't it time the UK and France put their political spats aside to prevent any more migrant deaths from treacherous channel crossings? So, Maggie, I want to come to you on this. So, so uh, there seems to have been some rather intemperate language. Uh, the French, uh, President Macron, is reporters calling Boris Johnson a clown, un clown, I think he would pronounce it, and a knucklehead. Um, obviously, the government sent a letter to to President Macron, which they took much umbrage at and disinvited the Home Secretary to a meeting. Can this be sorted out? Well, I do hope so. First of all, my thoughts must be with, as I'm sure as the whole audience tonight, with the loved ones of those people who sadly lost their lives. And they lost their lives because of criminality. And it's that criminality we need to stop. But you talked about the letter that uh, went uh, last week, and that letter had already gone through all the formal channels. It was actually saying to the French, let's work together. There's lots of things we can do because... You know, it's... So why do you think they were so offended? Look, I'm not sure why they were offended, but I think there's some very sensible measures in there. And you know, we, we do work very closely with the French. They were one of our most important allies. I think it's important that you know, it's it'd be good for the French to work with us. It's good for the UK, but more importantly, it's good for those people that, that sadly are having their lives put at risk. It's so important that we actually address the criminality, address the, address the trafficking and stop that because people are, are getting to, to Europe under false pretenses thinking that it's, it's a safe crossing and it's not at all. And you know, they, sadly, people are losing their lives because of it. Wendy. Yeah, um, I, I do think the dispute between uh, Macron and Johnson is particularly unedifying, particularly when this week on the news we have seen the faces and the families of those people that lost their lives. Um, where, where I disagree with Maggie is, is you know, Priti Patel has been in charge of uh, this situation for two years. And frankly, everything that the government seems to have done has made the situation worse. We are seeing more people travelling, uh, making these dangerous crossings because the government have actually taken away the safe and legal routes for these people who are fleeing persecution, who are fleeing war. There was one person who had come, he'd been working for, for and with the British Army in Afghanistan. He, the government have been promising that they're going to bring 20,000 Afghanistan refugees to the UK, 5,000 this year. They haven't brought anybody back in yet because the, the scheme hasn't started. So people are fleeing for better lives and um, making those desperate crossings. It's been tragic how this one has unfolded in, in the last few days. And actually, we've got a long, long and proud history of um, being a place of, of sanctuary. Um, and we need to uh, do our bit. We need to work with the French. We need to work with all our European allies. That's what the government says that it wants to do. But um, clearly, clearly, we need to ensure that uh, we prevent these crossings from happening. And we do that by allowing those who need to claim asylum a safe passage in which to do so. Theo, is it time the UK and France put their political spats aside to prevent any more deaths from this, from channel crossings? I think it's a, it's a very sad situation because it's now been politicised. Yeah. And we are now talking about men, children, women, bodies floating in the channel in this day and age. Um, we're politicising by selling, sending letters to world leaders that we tweet and that's what they got offended about, is the lack of treating it... <laughs> it's the lack of treating it seriously. And I'm quite sickened because, you know, it, it's not a UK problem. No, it's not. And it's not a French problem. And it's not a European problem. This is a world problem. And we've got to tackle it together. Because, as far as I'm aware, Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan are not in the EU. So it's, let's not bash... EU, let's not bash the French, 
unless we work together and not use the whole tragedy as a political pawn, which quite sickens me, to be honest with you, we're never going to deal with it. Come here and watch that. But these uh, people are already in a safe country called France. Um, why, what is the attraction to come to the UK? And shouldn't we um, do other things over there, form private companies to buy up all the dinghies? I know that I'll just push the problem somewhere else, and I know it, it, it may not solve the problem, but if it stops one more death by buying one more dinghy, then shouldn't we be doing something like that? Like, we buy any dinghy.com? Um, Do you think that might result in lots more dinghies being made? It probably would, and it would probably push the prices up. Um, but what else, what, what else is anybody doing? All right, the woman there in the black top. Um, I travelled through Calais about a month ago and um, <coughs> saw... It was mostly young people, actually, sitting on the side of the road, drying clothes on just makeshift dry bits of sticks. Saw people being young people again, mostly, taken out of vans. They'd obviously tried to get out, been picked up by the police, just dumped on the side of the road. The lack of humanity... I mean, it was extreme. I was very distressed to see it firsthand like that. It's the, it's the lack of humanity. What life do they have? We can surely solve this problem. As, as I agree with you, Theos, it's a global issue and we need, to, we need to react to it in that way. And the question is about the, 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 the spat between the French and, and, and the British government. What do you make of, of what you're seeing there? Me? Well, I, th I think it's bigger than that. I think, you know, get your heads out of the sand. Act like, uh, it's lack of integrity, referring back to Maggie and the party. I am sick of the lack of integrity uh, amongst worldwide, actually. You know, let's just be human and think of it in that way. These are people that want a life. They have no life. OK, the man here at the front. Yeah, hi, we seem to think that the government's responsible for solving all of these issues, um, but perhaps the public could actually take... Uh, uh, a greater role globally in how we can support people in need. And, and how, do you, uh, how do you see that? I think we all kind of look on it sa in sadness at these events um, from the comfort of our own homes. Um, and actually, I think, you know, it's about time that we actually looked at things in a very different way, whether that was funding. Back to Theo's point earlier about cancelling Christmas parties, you know, perhaps we could use all of those funds from businesses that are cancelling Christmas parties this year to go to those in, in most need. OK. Sangam. Um, well, first of all, in straight answer to Ashley's question, is it time for them to put their personal spats aside to save lives? Yes, absolutely, of course it is. It's unedifying in so many ways. And as well as the channel crossing at tragedies, there are other reasons why the French and the British need to be able to get along. We need to fight climate change. We need to fight uh, counter-terrorism. There are all sorts of other reasons to do that. To come back to safe and legal routes, which Wendy mentioned. Now, people have asked, what could we do? And, and the, the gentleman mentioned, you know, we, we can't just hand ring. Well, there are things the government could do right now. First of all, they could re reverse the atrocious cuts to overseas development aid. That could be done straight away because it benefits everybody as well as the people who directly receive it. We could work upstream with partners in other countries about how we try and protect people from evil, vile traffickers. And they are evil, vile traffickers. But Maggie, I'm afraid, is quite wrong when she says that it's the traffickers that cause the problem. The problem is war, conflict, persecution and the lack of safe and legal routes. Why do people come from France? Actually, France takes more than us. So does Germany. But when people come here, and I know this because I've got constituents who've, ha who've got here and have been able to claim asylum and are trying to be reunited with their families. I have constituents who I tried to get out of Af Afghanistan in the run-up to the fall of Kabul. Months and months of months on the phone to the Home Office trying to get people who had the legal right to be reunited with their wife and children and we couldn't get them here and do you know what they're doing now? They are desperate. They are trying to get here because they want to be with their families. People come here, I think we should be proud of the fact that people are they see this place as a place of sanctuary. We should be proud of that, but we need to provide safe and legal routes, bust the traffic in networkers, at networks, and also restore the cuts to overseas development aid. We, need, we could do all those things now, Maggie. We could do them now. Peter. Well, I think it's such a shame that this has become so politicised. 
I quite agree that this is really a humanitarian issue. I'd also say from the point of view of somebody who works in science and in universities that a lot of our extraordinary talent does actually come from overseas. A lot of the most internationally mobile people are the, are the best talents in terms of innovation, in terms of science. Uh, something like 40% of Nobel Prize winners win their prize in a country which was not their country of origin. And I think, you know, people who move actually should be applauded and we ought to be finding ways to help them. Can, okay. can I come in and very quickly take another question? Yesterday in Parliament, I met two um, people who were seeking asylum. Their processes were underway. One was a human resources professional. The other one was a social worker. And we don't allow asylum seekers to work. Right. They are people that we could be having okay. working uh, in, in our uh, health service, in our social work, in our supply chains, and the government don't allow them Maggie, to work. Maggie, you wanted to come back in very Yes, quickly. I just wanted to dispute something that Thomas said, that actually since 2015, we've brought 25,000 people in through safe and legal routes, which is more than any other EU That's country. That's also not true. And I'm afraid it is true, and we do have those late legal and safe routes. But we don't, overall, we take fewer refugees than, than many European We can't countries. get people out of Afghanistan, Maggie, and you know it. We, we, we have got schemes uh, put, being put in place, and it's important that... that we're... When? When is this scheme coming? Yep. The government knew for a very long we, time that brought, we were eventually going to withdraw. I know that the fall of Kabul scheme, took people which was, by surprise. And we, we were very quick off the mark with Operation Pitin, no. and, and that should you be left recognised. A lot of people behind. You left a You're lot of people behind. To to the UK. You left a lot of people who already had the right to be here. You knew that eventually we were going to withdraw from, from Afghanistan. There was no plan. There was no plan. And that's left people who work for the British authorities, for the British Army, interpreters, whose lives are at risk right now, who are, for all we know, being tortured, and actually I do think we do know that they are, by the Taliban. We have let those people we, we've down. Lots we have of people let them out, down. And, we're, and, we're got, and we're creating safe and legal routes for when? others as well. When? When? When is it coming? It's, it's, we need to make sure that the, the people have come through in a, in a timely it was fashion. August. We will be. It was will August. Be. It's now December. We still don't have the scheme. And you know how to do a resettlement scheme because, as you said, you did it's have previous resettlement, resettlement schemes. schemes. So it's not that hard. We're not starting from scratch. And, and actually, I, I, I think that the professor is right. People do want to, to, to see that sort of that, that richness of society. I think people in this in this audience have said that they want uh, us all to be able to welcome people who okay. need to flee We've dangerous society, very well. dangerous places. And you had a chance and you failed. All right. Let's take another question from Carl McDermott. Uh, after the recent shuffle, is the Labour Party now a credible opposition or must they continue to rely on the conservative, on conservative blunders to make their progress in the polls? <laughs> Well, you're laughing, Fagan. Let's see if you're still laughing in a minute. Wendy. So I think what was interesting about this week is the fact that this is the second reshuffle that the uh, Labour Party have made in six months, which does suggest that maybe May didn't go exactly uh, as they had planned. Um, what's clear is, is, is it certainly does feel to, to me as um, a politician in another opposition party. And, you know, my view is quite clear. I am elected as a Liberal Democrat, and my job is to oppose the government unless they persuade, persuade me otherwise, because I've been elected on the basis of the policies on which I stood. Um, so as an opposition par politician from another party, I do feel that this does feel like a reshuffle that is now looking forward positively for the Labour Party to the next election. It'll be interesting to see how it goes. I do think Yvette Cooper is a loss as chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee because I think she had a powerful role there in holding uh, the government to account. But yeah, it's quite clear that um, the issue, you know, we've talked about it already this evening, the last 20 months and the number of things that we feel the government hasn't got right. We need to have a credible opposition and Labour are the biggest uh, party uh, as an opposition party to do so at the moment. It's not often we hear a rival party praise another party's reshuffle. Meg, would you like to do the same? <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I think, I think the timing was, was probably not quite the best timing. Uh, but apart from that... You were referring the, the, to the fact the, the, that the deputy leader was making a speech at the time. Exactly, the yes. yes. I think you, it's always known that governments are stronger with strong opposition. And you know, I, I think it's been 
actually great that Labour have been supportive of us during the, the, the pandemic. I think it's been really important that we've worked together. But it's important also we have strong opposition in other ways. And, and yes, as, as Wendy says, we do need to be held to account. And I think it makes better government when we've got strong opposition. So you know, time will tell whether the, the new shadow cabinet is stronger than the previous one. And I look forward to the coming weeks and months and seeing if that's the case. OK. Man in the white chair. I think that going back to the gentleman's question is that the, they've had two Labour reshuffles, but does not, that not evidence that, one, Labour are willing to change, and then when they're willing to change, they're also happy to reflect on that, review that and go, OK, yes, that didn't work, but we're going to try again. When we look at the opposition party, we see failure after failure, lie after lie, you know, denial after denial. Where do we so stand The opposition with that? party is, is Labour, is that... No, with the Conservative Party. You, you, mean, you mean the government? Yeah, with the right. government, yeah. <laughs> OK, man in the brown sweater. Um, people talk about a one nation, a one party nation, but is that not simply because, let's be honest, there really isn't much of a credible alternative and there hasn't been for years? Not much of a credible alternative and there hasn't been for years, Fangham. Uh, well, I obviously disagree um, because I think, you know, M Maggie says that the government needs strong opposition. I think we've been good and critical when we've needed to be and we've been cooperative when it's been in the nation's interest. Nobody wanted the government to fail to protect our health. However, I can point to any number of, of U-turns that this party, my Labour Party, that I'm proud to be a Shadow Cabinet member of, has forced the government into over the last year when it was necessary. I mean, just when I was Shadow Housing Secretary, it was quite hard to get the government to acknowledge the damage that was being done on cladding for instance and I was very proud when I was able to push um, the then um, uh, uh, actual Secretary of State for Housing to make a commitment to £3.5 billion pounds for cladding removal but just as an example point, now, what about the, the, the just to, to save you yeah. listing all the new terms you believe <laughs> that you've made what about the point that with the second reshuffle in the six months it's an indication the first one didn't work now I quite like the gentleman's point up there about how that's a sign that we reflected and we put <laughs> the right people and we tried people <laughs> out I quite, obviously quite liked his point and I have to say also if there yes I, I mean if is obviously a loss to the Home Affairs C Committee, but I cannot wait to see her go against Priti Patel in the actual dispatch box. She is a tower, a force of nature. <laughs> But so too are so so too is the in my view the okay. entire shadow cabinet has slimmed down, effective shadow cabinet, scrutinising the government, doing what we're supposed to do, and I'm very thrilled and proud to serve in it. And we're waiting and eager for government by working hard. We're not just going to wait for it to come to us. Yes, the government. The reason I laughed okay, was goodness. because they're doing us so many okay, favours. Thanks, but I will keep going. It's turning into political <laughs> broadcast, and I think that's quite well, enough. Thank costume. you, uh, Theo. <laughs> Oh, I'm pleased because at the moment, um, Boris and team have been running around like a bulbous partridge looking for a pear tree to sit down on. I mean, <laughs> a the, bulbous partridge? Yes. I mean, absolutely. They've, they've had no opposition. I mean, it's become... Uh, it's been acting like an emperor. As far as I'm frustrated, it's because I live in the real world and I really do feel this government has to pull itself together now. Lost touch with reality, spin has taken over and we do need strong opposition to keep them honest and, and do you think they now look word. like a credible does Pardon? labor now look like a credible opposition Sorry? it's beginning to i think even even cooper coming back i think is a big big positive to the labor party um, and okay. i think as you quite rightly say i think the more good centralist labor uh members that come into the cabinet the shadow cabinet I think it will make them stronger, and who knows, one day they might have a chance of being electable again after the last debacle. Peter. Yes, I, I think an interesting question for us is whether those in government, those in the civil service, would actually be better served by having more of a, more of a science background, more of a STEM background, more of a university education. I think at the moment there are more people with a classics degree in the cabinet than there are with a science degree. And that, to me, is, is, a bit, is a bit strange, because I think that training in science is a really good background in logical thought. But isn't that because scientists don't want to be politicians? They're I mean, probably, certainly, when I yes. ask the scientists in my family, when well, they say exactly the well, same thing we got they a scientist they here? Mostly yes. they don't, but Maggie's a wonderful exception. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There All aren't right. many, because they mostly don't want to. They like, they like the science. I'm it's going to take... really broad, broad spectrum of backgrounds, and that's important. We do. I would something. agree. I'm going to take another question from Dave Morgan. Uh, Hi. Like many other parts of the UK, Western Supermares High Street is a shadow of its former self with loads of boarded up shops. 
So what can we do to revive it in a post-COVID world? Fear. Well, I, I drove past, uh, well, I didn't drive past, I walked back because pedestrians, the local Marks and Spencers, which is just now um, another dead shop. But it, it, the power is there. The power is there for the local authority to do something about it. So, so what it, can they do, Theo? Well, they, they can revitalise areas of the town by investing in the town. And at the moment, when I walk past some of those areas that we just spoke about, I don't know when a penny was last spent on it. And, and they need to start thinking forward, what's going to attract people there, look at planning, looking at support, and putting in place uh, an ecosphere that makes the, the high street, especially here in Western Supermare, far more active. We've seen some great developments on the seafront and with your wonderful pier and everything else, but you do need to worry about the local economy as well. It's not just about tourism. It's about investment that goes through for 12 months of the year, not just that summer period. Yes. You put your hand up. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's, I, I, I agree. I think uh, what we need to do is to not, not bring in these knee-jerk reactions to, uh, like, like the virus now, Omicron. You know, you've got to wear a mask. It, it seems ludicrous to me. It's, it seems to be an overreaction, which means that people are naturally going to go insular. They're just going to stop themselves from going out because they don't want to. Uh, go to the local high street in case they catch something that, that actually... But this, this, this is a pre-pandemic problem as well in terms of uh, shops closing on the high street. Uh, yes, it is. If you look but... at business rates now, mm. business rates is, is, in some cases, more than the rent. Now, you can negotiate with a landlord and say, look, I'm not going to take this shop unless you reduce the rent. You can't negotiate with a local authority on rates. And that's something that they really need to look at and get realistic about. Otherwise, you'll see a lot more stores emptied out. When Marks and Spencers move away, everybody else moves away as well. Okay. The man in the red sweater there in the middle. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think that, you know, business rates, rents, they're just too high. So if someone's thinking about starting a business, we should be supporting them by reducing, uh, you know, rent and rates and helping them. But the Chancellor did say he was going to review business rates, and sadly, yet again, another... Tory Chancellor kicks it into the long grass. Yeah. Man there in the shirt and tie. I used to live in a, a Victorian Edwardian residential area. And if you looked around, you saw a lot of the corner houses once had a shop. Supermarkets came along, finished them. So the super, supermarket started raining. Then the out of town miles came with free parking. People started going there. And then the internet came along. People started on internet. And the nail in the coffin is councils making charging for you to park. So nobody has the need to go to the high street nowadays. Western New Centre used to be beautiful. It's gone to the dogs now. Okay. It's to, I, I don't know if you call that progress, but that's, well, we've got to that's what's happened. All right, so let, let me get around the rest of the panel as well. Maggie. Yeah, I, I completely understand the issue and you know, I've got two towns in my constituency that have got very, very similar problems. And we, you know, we, we, we're determined to level up and people, and particularly the, the, uh, the Labour Party, seem to define levelling up as between north and south. And I don't believe that at all. I think you know, coastal communities are, are quite hard hit as well. I think it's important that we recognise that you know, because people, uh, until pandemic people went elsewhere for the holidays but hopefully now because of the pandemic we've realized just what lovely country we've got for people to, to come in and and to our coastal communities and what about theo's point about business rates well yeah, we've done an awful lot to support businesses i know a lot of uh, uh, shops in my constituency are quite small shops so they get uh, business rate relief which is really important it helps it make sure that they, they can keep going but i think we 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 have changed the way we use our high streets and i think you know it's, it's the onus is on us as well to use them or or lose them but we can use them in but a it, but different it, we'll way we'll lose them okay. because we can't people can't afford to uh, trade there when it costs you very little to trade online but if i can buy a pound retail online for 20p, why am I going to buy a pound retail for 75p in the high street? Okay. Well, as I said, the, you know, the onus is on, uh, on us to, to, to use it or lose it. And I think the high streets are changing. And, and, oh, and, I didn't uh, answer. 
And, and, okay. and, and adapt, I've and got to get round. And 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 People are laughing to, at that, Maggie. Why do you think well, that is? I, I mean, I actually shop in my constituency, and I, I'm proud to support my local uh, shops. And I think that, yeah, that's the message I'd like to put it's out. That we can't blame there. other people, and we're not doing it ourselves. The cost of also, there. the culture's changing. And we can change okay. the culture around. Um, so it's, it's a, it becomes a destination. So we go for a, a, a coffee and do different things in our high streets. It's not just about what we see as retail. Wendy. So the one area where I do agree with Maggie is I do think our high streets have changed in terms of it is somewhere where we go to socialise as well as to shop and there's a much more mixed economy. It's actually Small Business Saturday this weekend and I'm going to be in two areas in my constituency, St Andrews, which does have a Ryman's deal, you'll be pleased to, to know. Excellent. And, uh, <laughs> and, and it has a real range of independent shops supported by a business improvement district, which using funding through the Scottish Government um, actually developed an app, a shopping app, so that during the pandemic, those local independent businesses who couldn't afford to do that themselves were able to do so. The other places is Leaven, which is a very economically de uh, deprived part of, of, uh, of Fife. And actually it's seeing some investment coming in because there's a railway coming to the constituency and the community. It's really important that they get a say on how that money is done. But I agree with Theo in relation to business rates. I agree we need to support local authorities. But there's two other things the government are doing that I think is wrong. One is in relation to VAT. We've asked for it, the Liberal Democrats have asked for that to be um, kept at 5% till April. They've not done that, so businesses are seeing those increased costs now when things are really difficult. And second of all, just remember, those national insurance hikes that you're all gonna feel, we're all going to feel in our pockets as individuals are also felt by businesses as well. That's okay. increased cost to businesses at a time when they can least afford Peter. it. Peter. I, I think there's so many changes going on in the world, and this is obviously a major change. I don't know how it's going to play out, but I think we need to rethink what it is we do in our high streets, in our centres. How do we return to having more of a community feel in our centres? How we do that needs a lot of thinking, and I don't think that's a, an issue which I'm competent to speak about. Okay. Okay. Peter, can I just... Let, let, we no, please, I'm just, we've got about a minute and a half left, and if I don't get to thank him, no, as we want to hear you, I've got to let thank him answer this question as well. Well, I'm going to try not to say anything anyone said or already said, so I would say we need to sort out the tax system so the online world and the offline retail world have got some sort of equality well trade-off. We know this. We could, we could also do with the Minister for the Supply Chain, because I know a lot of my small businesses, and yes, I will also be shopping in my high street as well <laughs> on, on Saturday, but it's not just small businesses on the high street, it's also the supply chain as well, which needs a lot of love and support, and I think we could really do with the Minister for the Supply Chain, but for heaven's sake, sort out the online tax system. Oh, will you? I'll I'm sure the one. Chancellor will be listening to, watching this tonight and I'm sure he'll get the message. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Boom. I've got time for one more point from the audience. Yes, the man in the check shirt here. Yeah. The expression, use it or lose it, starts to sound suspiciously like the government ba blaming us for the problem. Yeah. It does. <laughs> I was putting, I was, that's how I see it, in that I know that if I don't use my local shops, then I, I, we will lose them. We, you know, we, it is a community which I'm willing to support. OK. Be able to afford it. They can't afford it here, it says. Right, OK. We could talk about Western Supermare High Street for some time, I think. Well, Theo, certainly you could, anyway. Could. But look, our hour is up. Thank you very much to the panel for coming this evening. Thank you to all of you here in Western Supermare for coming along. And, of course, thank you to you at home for watching. And if you want to get a bit more of a fix on news and current affairs, you can watch my colleague, Laura Koonsberg, on uh, Newscast, which is on just after this. But from Question Time, here in Western Supermare. Bye-bye. <laughs>